Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. So we have uh, our next speaker, Kaza Samindola, and uh, he is going to start his first lecture now. All right. right. Well, yeah, thank you, everybody. And uh, yeah, I'm very happy to be here as well and excited to um, tell you about uh, this topic. So the title of my course is a bit long. It says um, it's algebraic identifiability and Lyliquid geometry of linear Gaussian graphical models. Uh, so that's a lot of words. And so the hope is to explain everything so that this makes sense uh, by the end. And so I will start with um, the first part, which is the, the graphical models and then the Gaussian graphical models. So in this first lecture, it's going to be some preliminaries so that we can understand the model. So um, I guess I should say, uh, so Thomas has been explaining ideals and you in the preparatory course, you learn about the algebraic geometry, commutative algebra, which is very nice because these are going to be helpful tools to study these statistical models. So these, so this lecture is actually in the context of um, of algebraic statistics. Which is this uh, field that uses techniques from commutative algebra, um, algebraic geometry, combinatorics to solve problems in statistics. And so, um, and so specifically now I'm going to talk a bit about graphical models, which are the last two words in my title. And so, what are these? So, this is a family of statistical models. Um, that represent relationships or relations among several random variables. Okay. So there will be several random variables and they interact with each other and we want to understand these relationships. And so the idea will be to visualize this through graphs. Okay. And so in a sense, we will be combining a little bit of graph theory with probability theory, okay? So um, how exactly? Well, each vertex of this graph, right? so a graph will consist of vertices and edges, and the vertices are going to be uh, the random variables. So each vertex represents a random variable. And then each edge expresses dependence between these random variables. And there can be multiple types. So the a common one is directed, so there will be directed edges. So that means there is a direction. It goes from somewhere to somewhere. Uh, there could also be undirected. And they could also be bidirected. Oh. Um, and so in, in this lecture series, we're going to be focusing on the directed case. And I also want to tell you a bit of the about the bidirected case uh, in the later lectures. Okay, so um, as you can imagine, this has many applications. So I'm just gonna mention here. So, so this school is about um, algebra and geometry with a view towards applications, 
And so these models have many applications. Um, for example, uh, medicine. Uh, for example, language processing. And for example, machine learning. Okay, so um, you can imagine how it's useful to know if you have several variables, how they interact with each other. And so this is this can be used everywhere, right? So I mean, I should say there were have been some precursors of this uh, this theory in. Physics, for example, so in physics, in genetics, in economics, they are also used. And um, so they really took off after work. Um, so I'm going to say um, these models um, take off after work from uh, Pearl, so Judia Pearl. I'm going to give you a date, like 19, 1988. Uh, Whitaker, 1990, and uh, Lauritsen, Stephen Lauritsen. He has a very nice book uh, with the title Graphical Models from 1996. He's currently working on the second edition that's going to be uh, you know, updated with many things that have happened since 1996. So this, this is a, an active area of research. And um, one more maybe historical comment, uh, I'll, men I'll mention the 2011 Turing Award, this prestigious award. Uh, so given to Judy Pearl precisely for his um, founding role in this area of probabilistic graphical models. Okay, so that's a bit of the um, you know context, so you can have an idea of where where this is coming from, and maybe I'll um, I'll start with a nice example. So, what would be such kind of graphical model? Very simple example. Uh, let's say I have three random variables: x one, x two, and x three. That I binary. So this means they take values in zero or one. And my model will be the following. So x1 is if this, uh, the question is this a boring lecture? Okay, so boring lecture, then it's a question, right? And then can be yes or no. Um, another one could be x2. Is this an early morning lecture? <laughs> so, and maybe these two variables will have to do with a third variable, which is, uh, is the audience asleep? Right, so if... Uh, some of you then are like sleeping. And then so we could think that these have to do with each other, maybe some interaction. So maybe I would think that, well, if the lecture is boring, maybe there will be a directed edge here. And also in this one, it's going to have some impact on this variable here about audience uh, sleeping. Right? And then uh, this kind of model is where we would start to maybe have observations and try to do inference on one variable through the others. Right? So for example, let's say that um, if I see that uh, the audience is asleep, well, I know that this is not an early morning lecture. So then this increases the probability that of this type of this variable. Okay. So, okay, so this is an example. Um, and maybe I'll give you one more example maybe a bit less, uh, you know, a bit more serious. Um, so maybe smoking. Uh, whether someone has uh, yellow teeth. 
Um, maybe tar in lungs. So everybody knows so tar, you know, this like uh, viscous uh, liquid, dark brown that forms with, with carbon. Um, maybe here, then this cancer. And maybe here some uh, asbestos. Right, so again, this uh, like fibrous uh, silicate mineral that sometimes used for used in some buildings. So this is known as a as carcinogen. Um, so you could have a model like this, right? And then so you would try to understand again the relationships between these variables. Okay. So I will come back to these two examples once we have a bit more um, of uh, language to discuss the independence and dependence. But okay, so I will, I don't know how much background, so I, I hear it has been everything very algebraic, but I will need some notation and concepts from probability and um, you know, especially related to random variables, and random vectors. So as I don't know exactly what's the, you know, everybody's background here, so I'm gonna, set some basic notation and, and concepts, okay? So, so I'm gonna have random variables, um, X, capital X, I'm gonna know them like capital X, and the values, I'm gonna denote them by a small, a small X. Um, all the, the variables, so basically are gonna be Gaussian, that's that's what that's that's the the next word if we go uh, in inverse order in the title. So I'm gonna have dealing with continuous random variables. So they will have a density, a density function, f x. And so what does this mean? Um, so it means that, um, for example, the probability that x is in some interval a comma b, I can compute this by integrating from a to b this density function. Okay, so, um, so I'm hoping this is familiar to almost everybody of you, but if not, uh, please feel free to, to ask questions and stuff. And so in particular, uh, note that uh, so if this is a real random, uh, real valued variable, the integral over all R, so from minus infinity to infinity, of this function has to be one, right? So this is a non-negative function that is integrating to one. Okay. So uh, these variables have uh, expected value or mean gonna denote it like this, expectation of x, and that's gonna be, uh, well, the integral over r x times f of x. And um, I will also talk about the variance. And the variance is just expectation of x minus expectation squared, okay, which will be uh, non-negative. Okay. So is this uh, familiar to everybody? So hope you have seen this at some point, mean variant of random variables. And uh, well, for in our case, um, we are going to be talking about Gaussian. So what is the Gaussian? So the Gaussian is gonna have two parameters. So the notation is gonna be like this, N for normal. And there's gonna be two parameters, mu and sigma squared. And the density for such a, a Gaussian It's going to be one over the square root 
of 2 pi sigma squared e to the minus 1 half x minus mu squared um, sigma squared. OK? And so uh, this density function looks like this famous uh, bell-shaped curve um, where there is a, the maximum is attained at mu, and then sigma is controlling this um, dispersion of the density. Right? So a, a smaller sigma will concentrate it more, and a larger sigma is going to spread it. Right. Okay. So this is the this is the Gaussian, and well, it's um, a nice exercise <laughs> to show that uh, well, first of all, this f is really a density function, right? So you um, one has to show in principle that the integral of this is one if you integrate this over all uh, r from minus infinity to infinity. And I assume you would be able to do this. So it's a nice exercise done usually actually in analysis, right? When one is studying uh, polar coordinates, for example, right? So there's a, a typical application uh, of multivariate calculus to compute that this integral is actually one. Um, and in the same vein, thinking about maybe some analysis um, exercises, you should, um, you know, one can prove that expectation of x using this definition is going to be precisely mu. And the variance is going to be sigma squared. OK? So these are correctly named, that's it. Right? So, um, so I don't know, again, so I hope many uh, of you would be able to maybe do this, or at least you have seen it. And and if not, maybe we can you know, talk maybe a little bit about this in the in the tutorials if, if it's unfamiliar. Okay, so um, now okay, maybe I will I will erase here. So the next step would be, instead of, we're not only going to be looking at one variable, but at many variables, as I said here before. And so I want to talk about vectors. Right, so we will actually be dealing with random vectors. x1 to xm. random vector, and it will have, again, I'm going to be thinking about some continuous case where there is a joint density function, f, that goes from rm to r, non-negative, maybe uh, to, to express the non-negativity, I'll go do it like, I'll write like this. And now the probability that uh, this random vector is in some subset of our M can be computed via this interval, right? So um, maybe x1 to xm, dx1, dxm. And a crucial definition is when I have two random variables, so random variables with a joint density <laughs> fxy, right? So I look at them as a random vector x comma y, then they will have um, a joint density, and so um, what the so-called marginal densities, fx 
and if y. Uh, we're going to say that these two variables are independent. And this is, again, a crucial definition because we want to be able to say when two variables in our modeling have nothing to do with each other, this is the mathematical name is going to be independent. And well, this happens if and only if um, f x y can be factored as the product f x x times f x y. Okay. So this would be right. The you can take it as the definition of independence of these two random variables. This would be any space? Uh, sorry, A? A, yeah, so A should be a you know, measurable subset of Rm. Yeah. So, um, OK, and the notation will be x independent of y, which should think you think of some kind of, maybe you use this in kind of orthogonal. And we will see soon in what sense they, they are orthogonal. But yeah, this x independent of y does a notation. OK, so we have this. And now I also want to define the conditional distribution, the conditional density, which is f of x given y. And this is going to be the joint density divided by the marginal of y. Okay. And so this is the conditional density. And everything, I mean, the intuition, everything is coming from probability of events, which um, I'm sure you've seen at some point, right? So probability that x and y happen at the same time. If they are independent, it means that this is the product of the probabilities. And here, they should think about some conditional probability. A probability that a given b is the probability that a intersect b divided by the probability of b, as long as this one is non-zero. And so note in particular that then if x is independent of y, this is actually f of x. Right, so this is just a observation, uh, which means this reinforces our intuition that x is independent of y if, when I condition on y, I don't change the density of x. Right, so I don't gain any new information about x. The probabilities stay the same. And so this is uh, important for our intuition. Okay. Great. So now I want to talk about conditional independence. So assume we have three variables, x, y, and z. And um, OK, so then we have some conditional density f, x, y, given set. That will be the joint x, y, set divided by the marginal of set. And so, OK, so what are we going to say? So x and y are conditionally independent given set if and only if for all set 
it holds that the this f of x y given set equals little set. can be factored as f of x given set times y given set. So these are both conditional conditional densities themselves. So and so this this equality holds for all x, y. And so we denote this highlight with blue x independent of y given set. Okay. So here was x independent of y. So we say that x is conditionally independent of y given set. And the idea intuition is the same. It says that if we know set, then having information about Y doesn't give us any new knowledge about X. Okay. Um, okay, good. And so there was this, uh, okay, I'll let me raise here. So in the first example I had about um, the the lecture being boring or not, and this, so we had uh, maybe I'll I'll just put it quickly here, right? So there was a boring uh, early and asleep. Right, so let me just call them. He was like x1, x2, and x3. So what is now I can actually tell you what this is modeling in terms of independence and conditional independence. So for example, one of the relations that are encoded in this graph uh, is that x1 is independent of x2. So the, this means so they are they have nothing to do with each other by themselves. They're just independent. Um, however, they will not be independent when we condition on x3. So then here it's a not. x1 not conditionally independent of x2 given x3. And so this was what I was telling you, right? So if I observe people uh, sleeping, then this actually gives me information now so that if I know the value of x2, I can infer something about x1. So if I don't know x3, then they are independent, but given this information, I'm able to say uh, things between them. And so here, there are also relations. Um, let me give you some. Um, so for example, smoking independent of asbestos. These are independent, these two variables. But if I condition on, for example, whether the person has a cancer, they don't, they stop being independent. Okay, so this would be, uh, the analog of this example here. But now one thing I want you to notice is that if when you condition on knowing whether this person has cancer or not, um, this can flow right, through the graph. So this maybe doesn't, I mean, towering lungs is here. The smoking is even farther in this chain, but it still affects uh, smoking and asbestos. So this is something that we'll see how uh, um, these relations spread through the network, not just in one level, but it could be several levels. 
Um, okay, so I told about the smoking and asbestos and cancer. I want to say maybe two more. Uh, so for example, let's say yellow tea. is not independent of tarring lungs. So these are not independent because, well, they have a common, a common uh, possible cause, which could be, which is smoking. And um, however, if I condition on that, on that cause, yellow teeth will become conditional independent of tarring lungs conditioned on smoking. So, because now you really know this information and they become independent. And um, yeah, so you can see then this conditional independence relation is quite interesting and can be, it's non-trivial. So there is no, um, direct relation in the sense of monotony, right? So it's not true that if you have something that's uh, independent and you add stuff, it stays independent. That's not true. And the other way around, right? So maybe this is not independent and you condition and it becomes uh, independent. So it's not true that you can add something or remove something and it will stay independent. So this means there is actually some interesting relationships going on between variables. Okay. So um, let me then continue a bit with, oh, I still have some space here. Going back to this probability um, notation, um, so we had random vectors. Uh, so the expectation of a random vector, it's, um, well, as you expect, it will be the expectation of each one of the coordinates. Okay. So then this will be a mean vector. And having this density is very useful because it not only allows us to compute um, things like this, probability of x in A, but allows us to compute the expectation of function of this vector x. Uh, what do I mean? So one example is, uh, let's say one want the expectation of x plus y, if x and y are two random variables. And so I could think of this as being the vector x comma y, the random vector x comma y, and I look at the density f x y. And so I would say I can compute this by integrating over r to x plus y f x y x y dx dy. Right, so here, what am I using? So I'm thinking of x plus y as a function of this random vector x, which has this density, and this function I put here into the expectation, right? And so this kind of um, equation allows me then to compute, you'll see from here this integral, you can actually split it, right, into um, x times xy, well, I'm, Okay, so you have f x y x y. So if I want to, um, let's say, integrate to d x, well, I guess integrate d y, so that then I will recover the marginal with respect to x. I'm gonna skip a step here. Um, so this should be now r. Uh, y times f x y d y. And so this gives this famous, you know, uh, property that this is the expectation of X plus the expectation of Y, right? So the expectation is a, is a linear operator. Okay? So this is true. And of course, it's also true that uh, C times, uh, if C is a constant, you can take it out from the expectation. 
to see content. Um, uh, yes, so. But the expectation of a constant is, is of course, the constant. And this implies other things and variances. For example, the variance of a constant is zero. This is something that may be useful to remember. Uh, so I, I want to mention the expectation of x times y. Because in, in, the same, in the same idea, I would put here x times y. And now, if I assume that x is independent of y, then we know that this can be then broken up into, into the two marginals, which means that now we can open up here this double integral into two separate uh, single integrals which will give us expectation of x times the expectation of y, right? So here, the, the property I'm, I'm using is that if x is independent of y, then the expectation of the product is the product of the expectations. And these naturally then leads me to, given x, y random variables, To talk about their covariance, right? So um, their covariance so this would be cov x y this is going to be the expectation of x minus expectation of x times y minus expectation of y. This. So that's the covariance between them. And um, it's an easy, easy to show. If you expand this product, you're going to get x, y, and then you're going to get some expectation of x times y and x expectation of y and then plus expectation and expectation y. But when you use the linearity of this big expectation, you, you see that you will only have this term expectation of x and y, and then there are two minuses and one plus of the same term, uh, namely the product of expectation of x, expectation of y. And so this is another expression for, for the expectation. Yes, question. It's more about the last equation, expectation of x plus one. Uh, yes, yeah, here I, I skipped, a, I skipped a, a step um, where, so here the idea is so I just break this up, right? So I do x times this plus y times this. And then I just integrate out um, in each one of these yes. double integrals. <laughs> Because the, I mean, I'll, I'll, be, I'll talk about this maybe uh, in the tutorial, but for example, the marginal, right, can be recovered right, by integrating respect to y. And so in one of the cases, I do that. So I, I do the dy and I get the fxy, uh, I, I get the fxx, which is the one that multiplies the x. And in the one that multiplies y, I do the opposite. So I integrate now with respect to x. So this is, this is what's happening. So that's why there was one term like this and one term like this. And then these are exactly these, uh, that's what I... Yeah, I'll maybe so maybe in the next lecture I can define the a, a more general and general form 
um, or any subvectors. That's what I find. OK, um, so yeah, so then these covariants, I wanted to then just, uh, again, point out that this is 0 if x is independent of y. And so um, this covariance really is, uh, can, you should think of this as some kind of inner product in, in, in this space of, of random variables. Um, so covariance is like it's a symmetric bilinear form or operator and use that word. Um, so, no, so for example, so obviously the covariance of x y equals the covariance of y x. That's what I mean by symmetric. But uh, also covariance of, let's say, x plus y and set is the covariance of x set plus the covariance of y set. That's what I mean by linear. And it also takes the constants out. As you can, everything is following from the definition. Um, there will be, if you put a c times x, there will be a c here and a c here that you can take out in the end. And so, these are properties of the covariants that are nice. And uh, as I said, so if this, so it kind of behaves like an inner product. Actually, the covariance of x times x is just the variance of x, right? Because here you just get the same squared, and that was the variance. So. And it's uh, so as I said, so if x is independent of y, the covariance is zero. Uh, the converse is not true. So this is a nice exercise if you've never done it. So it's a you know, nice try to try to find x and y that so that their covariance is zero, but they are not independent. So this is not an if and only if in general. Um, what else is there about covariance? I want to tell you. Yes. So. Um, the variance of x plus y. Now I can start using the covariance here. So for example, this will be the covariance between x plus y and x plus y. And using this bilinearity property, then you'll see I get the covariance of x with x, which is the variance of x. And then I get the covariance of x with y, and again, the covariance of y with x. So this is two times the covariance of x with y, and then I get the variance of y. And so um, in particular, we see again that if x is independent of y, then the variance is additive, which is something that was not true, and it's not true in general, even though it's true for the expectation. So this is one nice observation. Um, but if not, then we have this covariance term. And in general, the variance of um, a, a linear combination, AI, let me call them AIYI, or XI, use some XIs. A variance of sum of AIXI, let's say I goes from 1 to K, then this is going to be. You can think of this as some kind of, uh, you know, this sum squared, right? And so this is going to be the sum of AI squared variance of XI. I goes from 1 to K. And then 2 times the sum I less than J of AI AJ covariance of x i and x j. Um, so this is just the same, just a multivariate uh, computation for of this, right? So you get all the all the terms that are with itself, and then the the terms of x i with x j. 
which is uh, symmetric. That's why we get this twice. And so if we recognize this. So if we like, we like linear algebra, all of us here, right? So we recognize this as some quadratic form, right? So this is really, if you think of this A as a vector, A1 to AK, then this is actually A transpose uh, variance of X times A. And so this variance of X is gonna be the matrix that has as entries and the entry ij has the covariance of xi and xj. And so this is an important matrix just known as the covariance matrix. And so let me define it officially. So that var x, what does that mean? Is the covariance matrix of the vector x, the random vector x, and uh, um, so var n, let me like this. So the entry ij is the covariant of xi and xj, okay? So this is an important matrix to treat track of the interactions between all the coordinates in our random vector. And uh, one crucial property is that, uh, so key <laughs> property is that this matrix is symmetric And it's actually positive semi-definite. Right? Because um, you can see here, this quadratic form uh, will always be non-negative because it's the variance of something. Right? And so, uh, yeah. And then you can see, if we actually want it to be positive definite, then we just need that for a different from 0 this variance is not a constant, right? So that means then that the sum of the AI size, they are, uh, you can think of them as they are kind of in the linearly independent. Right? So this sum doesn't, doesn't lead to, to a constant. And so, um, yeah, so this is the variance and covariance. And uh, it's been a while since I give you an example. So let's go back to the example, which is, our favorite is going to be the multivariate Gaussian. <laughs> okay, so now the notation is going to be that this vector um, is going to be like this. And there will be two parameters, mu and sigma. And now uh, what's the form? f of x is going to be 1 over the square root of the determinant of 2 pi sigma. And now I'm going to have exponential minus 1 half x minus mu transpose sigma inverse x minus mu. And uh, so now x is a vector in our m. Mu is also a vector. And sigma is going to be a positive definite matrix. Symmetric positive definite. And um, so that you can actually invert it here, right? And so uh, this is the density for the multivariate Gaussian. And then again, exercise check that then the expectation of this random vector is actually the mean vector mu and the covariance matrix of this random vector is the sigma. Okay, 
So then everything matches up. Uh, I will define one more thing here that's going to be relevant for us. It's that the inverse of sigma this sim that appears there naturally, this is called the concentration matrix or sometimes called the precision matrix. I'm going to call it concentration. Okay, great. And so in the last, um, okay, we started a bit late, but I don't want to take up a uh, lot of the, you know, lunch time. So let me tell you about list some amazing properties for Gaussians. And I want to end with that. So, um, so again, so Gaussians are amazing, right? So they're great. And one of the reasons why they're great is because of the following properties. So, um, so first of all, let's say you have X is gonna be um, multivariate Gaussian. Maybe I'm even gonna write it as, um, okay, no, okay, let me do it like this. Mu sigma. And well, one of the properties is that if I transform these Gaussian linearly, so let's take A, a matrix, A times M, full rank matrix. And now I take a B, some vector in RK. Um, then if I do A times X, plus V, so it's a linear transformation of this random vector X. So this lives now in RK, right? So this was in RM, but now it lives in RK. So it's important that I, I'm gonna ask that K is less than or equal to M. Um, so this is now gonna be again Gaussian. So that's the, the first miracle. This is now a Gaussian in K space with what mean and what variance? Well. I'm going to tell you. So the mean is going to be what you expect is going to be A times mu plus B. Maybe like this. And the variance, what will it be? Well, it's like the first time, okay, I'm going to ask. So who knows the answer? What's going to be the, the new covariance matrix of this transformed? A squared. A squared. So it should have to do something with sigma, hopefully. Six. Sorry? Same sigma. A? The same sigma. The same sigma. So A doesn't affect at all. There is B doesn't affect A squared. Should, B doesn't affect. That's correct. A squared, A squared sigma. That would make sense, except the, the, the this should be a, a, a square matrix, right? This should be a K by K matrix. So we just need to be careful of the non-commutativity, but you have the right intuition, right? So this is actually A sigma A transpose. So um, because again, this should be a K by K full rank matrix. So we have uh, K by M, M by M, M by K. So this will give us a K by K. In the case where we have one dimension, then this will be just a squared times sigma. So yeah, this is one of the amazing properties of the Gaussian. The linear transformation is again, is again Gaussian. And now uh, let me really write it as this. Um, maybe this is M1 and M2. And now I'm gonna write this as mu one, mu two. And this is a block matrix, sigma one, one, sigma one, two, sigma one, two transpose, sigma two, two. Um, this. So um, 
does it does it see is it clear what I mean? So I'm I'm having this partitioning into m1 and m2. So this is a, a vector of length m1, m2, and in this matrix, this is m1 and this is m2. So it's a block, it's a block matrix, block representation. And so if we had something like this, then the first amazing thing is that we can look at the marginal of this Gaussian vector. And these marginals are Gaussian again. So in particular, this means that x1 is distributed Gaussian, m1, with what you would expect. This would be mu1 and the sub matrix sigma 1, 1 there. And analogously for x2, I'm going to just write it for completeness here. So they are both Gaussian, these, these marginals. And even more, the conditional of x1 given x2 is also Gaussian. And so this will be a Gaussian m1 with mean mu1 plus sigma1, 2, sigma2, two, 2 inverse, x2 minus mu2. That's going to be the mean. And the covariance matrix is going to be sigma1, 1, 1 minus sigma1, 1, 2, sigma2, two, 2 inverse times sigma1, 2 transpose. And so uh, I hope uh, you recognize this. What is this? It has a famous name, right, for this block. Linear algebra. What's the name? Right, so look what I'm doing. So I'm taking uh, this and then minus this times this inverse times this. Jacobian? It's not the Jacobian. This is called the sure complement. It's a sure complement. Um, yes. So okay, maybe uh, so you can see it's a bit more involved. This conditional distribution in M one. But you can see everything should make sense. Like, uh, you know, this is something that's in the dimension of M1, and uh, but it's Gaussian, and that, that's the key point. So this is a Gaussian. That's very nice. And um, then the very, very last thing I'll say, and then I really stop, is that, for example, from this proposition, we get an amazing, another amazing property. So let me just give you the case where you have two x1 and x2. Right, so this means that uh, you have mu one, mu two, and then the sigma is sigma one one, sigma one two, sigma one two, sigma two two. Then in this case, we see that x one will be independent of x two if and only if the sigma one two is zero. So let me put this as a corollary. And so this means, um, remember that sigma 1, 2, by definition, is the covariance of x1 and x2, right? So we already know that if they are independent, then this has to be 0. And I told you, the converse is not true in general. But in this case, it is true. If sigma one two is zero, then actually I claim they are independent. And why? Because if sigma one two is zero, I go here. So now everything this capital sigma is just a, a, a number, small sigma. This is zero, and then this is zero. So this gives us that the conditional of x one given x two is just mu one sigma one one, which is the original x1 right so this means that um right so sigma so proof <laughs> right so if sigma 1 2 is 0 then x1 given x2 
is this has the same density as x1 because here the sigma one two equals zero kills the, the that mean and the and the extra sigma the extra mean in the extra sigma there and so this means exactly that x1 is independent of x2 as we saw before and so um so the f's are the same that's what i mean and then here this is true okay so this is again so amazing properties of the gaussian and these properties then we will exploit them when we look at our Gaussian graphical models and how to understand their relationships there. Okay, so uh, there's a question. So I said that we did everything with Gaussian. So why not we can take with a Noli random variable or something other like exponential random variable? Yes, yeah, so in gen general graphical models, you can take any variables that you want. Um, and then you have to be careful in just the analysis, right? But so having Gaussian allows us to exploit many nice properties of the Gaussian. And that's why we're going to get very nice theorems and very uh, you know nice structure. But yeah, for example, discrete is also uh, studied a lot. Or um, if you like, the, there is this uh, extreme value theory where people are interested in extreme events. And then this excess would be something with has heavy tails, like Pareto distributions, Bible distributions. These are also important. So it really depends. So in principle, you can do whatever. But for this course, I decided to stay in the classical Gaussian case. But yeah, if you're interested, I can certainly give you references for Yeah, yeah thank you. Let's go for <laughs> lunch. <laughs> Um, now, uh, are there any other questions? Uh, are there questions from the IP? Right. Okay. How about the IP is giving some numbers? Yes. Mm -hmm. When it is giving us some, when it shifts back to the order. Yes. And all depend on approximations. How about the error? The error? Um, yeah, this will become apparent when we when we talk about it in the next lectures, I think. So the idea is that you have a model, right? But then of course you have data, and the data has has an error, and then the question will be how to then fit the the model to the data. Yeah, I will talk about this in the next lectures. Okay. Uh, if this is the case, let us thank the speaker once again. <laughs> And uh, now we are uh, going to have a night, uh, and there is a break uh, till 2.30. So everyone should be here in the venue at 2.30 because the next speaker will be online. So Miruna, uh, she is going to uh, talk about uh, her first lecture at 2.30. So now you can go for the lunch. So break. <laughs> Yes. <laughs>